Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 121 of the podcast. It's the 25th of April, 2018, as I record this intro. And it's Q&A time. This month, Anna Brown joins me again to answer your questions. We dig into questions around managing the environment when a parent works at home, when we're not a perfect mom, helping our kids learn about diversity, when you're not into your child's passion, and helping your children process their emotions without taking them on yourself. As a personal update, this really cool connection fell into place this week for me. So I get a lot of truly wonderful email from you guys, and I know I'm behind in replying. Life stuff has bubbled up in the last few weeks and not left me time right now, but I do read them, and so often I think, what an amazing story. I wish other people could hear it too. So then last week, I came across this online software called SpeakPipe, which allows people to easily create and send audio messages. And then I had my light bulb moment. What if you guys sent me your wonderful unschooling aha moment stories in audio? I could hear your lovely voices and be able to share them on the podcast. (laughs) So I thought, how cool would that be? (laughs) So let's try it. If you go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast, you'll see a section called share your aha moment. I've done a test recording and it's really easy. You just click start recording, give it access to your mic and you're ready. There is a five minute max, but it gives you a great timer so you don't need to guess how long it's been. There's also a reset button so you can start over if you like. It's easy peasy. I'd love if you shared your name, first name is fine, and your location because it's fun to know where in the world you're unschooling, but anonymous is okay too. I feel like this could be a great way for us all to get to know each other a bit better. And there's one other bit of news from this week. I started a new resources page on the website. It's at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash resources, but it's also on the website menu, so it's easy to get to. It's something I've been thinking about for ages, wanting to gather in one place the interesting books, websites, podcasts, and things that I've come across over the years, especially since starting my own podcast and getting to speak with so many interesting guests. And as much as I can, I'm including my own thoughts or reviews about the things, plus linking to any podcast episodes or blog posts in which the thing was discussed. I plan to add sections for documentary films, fiction books with unschooling characters, and more as it occurs to me. The page is by no means done, but it's far enough along that I thought I'd share it. And a huge thank you to everyone who has chosen to support my work through Patreon. And a big warm welcome to new patron, Kara Nelson. I really appreciate your help to share unschooling information with anyone who's curious to learn more about this wonderful lifestyle. You guys inspire me to keep exploring the fascinating world of unschooling. And if you'd like to support my work and this podcast, even for as little as a dollar a month, because it all adds up, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now for our quote this week. I don't typically share things that I've said in this section, But when Amber finished transcribing the episode uh, this week, she mentioned that this was her favorite moment, so I thought I'd share. I said, I think first I'd toss away the idea of a perfect mom and think in terms more of the mother you want to be. Because that phrase, quote, perfect mom, carries the idea of someone else judging us, whereas the idea of the kind of mother I want to be is all personal. It changes our perspective from an expectation to something we're aspiring to. Can you feel the difference between those? One is a weight on top of us slowing us down, that expectation. 
and the other is fuel, helping us move forward, something we're aspiring to. Over the years, I've come to see absolutist kinds of words as clues that I'm not thinking clearly. Words like perfect and always and never. They're at the very ends of a spectrum, of any spectrum. Not only that, they inherently hold judgment in them. Reality is messier and can be kinder, more compassionate. And now, on to your questions. Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and I'm happy to be joined this month by Anna Brown. Hi, Anna. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. And let's just dive right in. Do you want to start with the first question? Sure. Okay. Hi, we are a South African unschooling family. I have two sons, 10 and 8, and a daughter who is four years old. My two sons attended preschool, but when my eldest was supposed to go to grade one, we took them out of school and started homeschooling them. I started on a very rigid program, but started relaxing more and more as I realized that my eldest was very unhappy with sitting still and doing book work for hours. In the beginning of 2017, I made a new friend who happened to be an unschooler. She encouraged me to listen to some of the Living Joyfully podcast. I listened to one and it was as if I had found something that I had been looking for all of my life without knowing that I was looking for it. It was absolutely wonderful. It took some time to convince my husband, but he was willing to be convinced and then we jumped in completely. My question has to do with our home situation. We live in a very small house and my husband tutors online. There can't be noise when he is working, so I have to silence the kids all day long. My children are very active and loud and beautifully dramatic all of the time. It is very difficult for them to be quiet and I usually end up getting frustrated and taking my frustrations out on them. I try to take them on outings all the time, but I want my children to love their home. They don't want to be at home at all anymore. I do wonder sometimes if unschooling like this is really conducive to their happiness and well-being or am I pursuing a dream that does not fit in with our current situation or lives. I know that there's no advice that can change my circumstances at home. What I'm really looking for is ideas to make home more inviting and fun for them without spending too much as our budget is very tight. Thank you for taking the time to answer my question. Regards. So hello. And first, I just love um, that you're seeing your children and that all of you are finding your way to unschooling. And, and it sounds like it has brought a lot of joy. Um, and kind of what popped up for me is I'm thinking along the lines of finding ways to maybe soundproof your husband's space. Um, he can be in maybe a small section of the house. There are different wall pads that aren't expensive that could dampen sound. Sound canceling headphones might be an option, but you know, you'd have to see how the sounds can from the rest of the house through to his clients, but it, it might help. Um, because I would say that home is certainly a part of unschooling. You know, while we spent lots of times out in the world, home was really our haven and a place of joy and learning and connecting. Right now, personally, we're currently struggling with internet issues after a recent move. So today I'm in a tiny room that's like a fishbowl at the library <laughs> so that I can record with Pam. And, you know, maybe there are community options or some type of time sharing with spaces with your friends that might not be an everyday option for your husband, but an occasional option for him to give you more freedom at home. I would definitely be aware of your triggers. And when you feel yourself becoming frustrated, talk to the kids about that, not about their behavior, but how you're feeling concerned about their dad and what can we do to help give him the quiet he needs for his work and but while still enjoying our home? You know, because I think when you get them involved in the solutions, that's gonna help everybody feel included and heard, and then you have buy-in. Um, that said, I don't really think it's realistic to think that kids can be quiet in a small space all day long. But what I'm thinking is that maybe a combination of leaving home like you've been doing, being outside, even at your home, um, your husband finding some other options, you know, part time will be enough to get you through this time right now. Because something that I've learned along the way is that things change 
all the time. So it's really important not to project any particular issue way out into the future. You know, deal what's in front of you in manageable bites. So while you might say, well, no, long term, he can't go to a friend's house every week or whatever. He doesn't need to go every week. What if he just went one day this week and it gave you all time to reconnect at home? Or what if he found an option once or twice a month somewhere else? You know, so it doesn't have to be this forever and always, but find ways to deal with what's happening right in front of you right now, because again, things will change. So um, that's kind of what came to mind when I was reading your question, Pam. Yes, I I really enjoyed reading just a little bit about um, your journey to unschooling and and mm-hmm. then the podcast and uh, I I love that idea too because when I first discovered unschooling that leap was like oh my gosh this is perfect you know I, <laughs> I had no clue <laughs> but um, anyway I, I I found that question really interesting too. <clears throat> Now, for me, when I'm feeling uncomfortable about something, the first step is to try to tease apart what's going on to try and discover what's lying at the root of my discomfort. Because the initial challenge you talked about was maintaining a reasonably quiet home environment while your husband is working. Made sense. Um, And trying to play quietly at home for obvious reasons wasn't working. So you've been taking them out on outings. And from what you're saying, it seems like that's been working pretty well. Your husband's getting his work done in a quiet home. The kids are enjoying being out and about. So oh, I wasn't quite sure why you were looking to spend more time at home. So I just thought um, that might be something interesting for you to dig into. Because if, you, if you're looking to spend more time at home, you, you're back to, again, the initial challenge of staying quiet. And and I had a lot of wonderful ideas of the way to incorporate it, but to understand that better and what you, why you're needing that um, would be really helpful. The question of whether unschooling is a good fit in this situation, it's a really cool question, but really it has nothing to do with whether you're spending most of your time at home or out and about, because really it's dependent on everyone's needs. And in this case, the way you're talking about it, everyone's needs seem to be being met. You know, your kids Mm -hmm. are happy. They're enjoying being out. They want to be out. All that said, you didn't mention your needs. <laughs> so <laughs> as I said, that's where I think it could be really helpful to do some digging and brainstorming. Are you the one who wants to spend more time at home? Is that possible right now with your husband's work schedule and all those ideas Anna has had for playing around with that? So really, are there times when your husband isn't working or, or could be working out and you and the kids could be home, but they still want to go out? And you'd rather stay home, so that's why you're wanting to find ways to make home more inviting? These are the great things that we can figure out for ourselves. Now, I don't think we can come up with really fun ideas of things for your kids to do at home because we don't know your kids and their interests. But as Anna said, it's time to chat with them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So once you've done your own digging into all those questions, you'll be able to explain to them when, like in what circumstances, and why you're looking to be at home and see what they think about it. You can ask them what they might like to do. You can brainstorm ideas. Maybe there are some interests that they've put on the back burner because the focus lately has been on going out. And through those conversations, you may also discover what they love so much about being out and about right now. And that can help you feel more comfortable supporting that. And you hear me keep saying for now, for now, because then as Anna said, things will change over time, right? <laughs> Things do change, especially, you know, even when you think you finally found, uh, you know, a solution that seems to be working for everyone. And then something comes up like this whole question, right? It seems to be working for everyone. You you decided to go out, take the kids out more. They seem to be happy with that. Your husband's got a quiet, but something's niggling now. Something's feeling out of whack. So mm-hmm. that's the time you can start digging in to understand that better for yourselves so that then you can bring that knowledge into conversations with them. And, and that's the whole point is, you know, we always talk about staying connected with our kids. If you're, if you stay connected and you share, everyone's sharing their needs and their wants, and you're just exploring 
all the different ways that you can, you might be able to meet those, right? And as Anna said, um, you don't need to think about meeting them in the long term, right? This is exploration. Let's have fun. You know, maybe dad can try over over the next month, try a few different places that he can work. Or you guys can try a few different setups inside the home for him to have a more quiet area for him to work, et cetera. Um, and, and talk talking about the some interests, some things that they might like to do at home to make home a little bit more inviting or enticing to stay um, for them as well as you, if that's if that's the reason why you're pursuing the question. Anyway, I thought that was very cool. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> okay, question number two is from Alexandra in France. She writes, hello, thank you for your podcast and your help to all parents. I was wondering whether you can help me. I have been living with the unschooling philosophy for almost one and a half years. I do my very best, but sometimes I do not do everything perfectly. I'm not as good to my kids as I would like to. I can get annoyed by them when they scream without a reason, when they do not behave well, etc. And then I feel guilty. And this feeling makes me very sad and unhappy, especially when it happens during the day when I am at work and cannot see my children for hours. I really try hard, but I am not a perfect mom 100% of the time. And then I feel so powerless that it happened again and I was not as good as I would love to my children. Do you have any advice to such moms as me? Thank you very much. Hi, Alexandra, and thank you so much for your question. I think first I toss away the idea of, quote, a perfect mom and Mm -hmm. think in terms more of the mother you want to be. Because that phrase, perfect mom, carries the idea of someone else judging us, whereas the idea of the kind of mother I want to be is all personal. It changes our perspective from an expectation to something we're aspiring to. Can you feel the difference between those? One is a weight on top, slowing us down, that expectation. And the other is fuel, helping us move forward, something we are aspiring to. The other thing that jumped out at me was your language around your kids' behavior, because it really helps to try to see those moments through their eyes. So right now, through your eyes, you're seeing annoyance, but they aren't behaving that way to annoy you. They are trying to express something that's important to them because they don't scream without a reason. They have a reason. You just don't know what it is yet. (laughs) So try to figure that out. Last month on the Q&A, Anne talked about having a huge red stop button. (laughs) So when, when you feel your annoyance rising, try to hit that stop button and just pause for a moment. In that space, take a couple of deep breaths to try to diffuse your rising adrenaline. Then try to shift and see things from their perspective. What are they trying to express using the tools that they have right now? And you know, if things do go sideways, when they calm down, you can apologize, you can chat with them about what happened, you can brainstorm things you guys might do next time a similar situation comes up, you make a plan and try it next time. That's how we all learn about ourselves and about being in relationship with each other. Anna? Yeah, I mean, oh my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think I just wanted to say to be kind to yourself too, yeah. you know, and and talk to your children. I mean, gosh, we go back to this every single time because I think sometimes we're so in, internal with this conflict or, you know, judging of ourselves that really we just need to have conversations, you know, talk to your children, apologize when you say or do something that you wish you'd done differently because they're going to learn so much from that, you know, that we all make mistakes and that we can apologize and be kind and start again and that you're willing to have a conversation with them because, you know, we all have big emotions at times, you know, and don't hold on to those feelings. You know, those feelings aren't serving you or your children. Apologize, reconnect, move on with love in your heart and trust that, you know, you're all in this together. There is no perfect, you know, we're all humans and we're learning and growing all the time. And so I, you know, I just loved what Pam said too. I feel like, 
you know, find those ways to connect even in those moments, but then just make sure you're moving on when you have a conflict and something arises, just reconnect and then let those pieces go because that weight carrying around again is not serving anyone involved. So that's, that's what I have. <laughs> yeah. I think that is such a huge piece. Um, mm-hmm. when you're first coming to de-schooling is that shift in the adult child relationship, yes. right? Cause there's so often like we come into this thinking, you know, we're the parent, we should know better. We should know how to solve this. You know, we should like, you hear that should there, right? Yeah. All the time. That's <laughs> that expectation, that perfect mom idea that I need to figure this out and then be right. this new person with my kids. N- no, <laughs> that that's the, the whole shift where you become, become human beings together. It doesn't mean yes. like we're not more experienced. We are, you know, we've had more life experience. Absolutely. But we're still all human beings together. They still have so much value to add to those conversations. Once you start having them, you're like, holy crap, I need to go ask my kids, right? Right. (laughs) And once they see, I mean, these are emotions, again, that people are going to be dealing with until the end of days. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think if we can be more open about that, you know, how you're feeling and, and like the question before talking about, oh my gosh, I feel myself getting frustrated because I'm worried about, you know, dad trying to do this or in your case, you know, for this mm-hmm. question that, you know, I didn't mean to say that I'm feeling frustrated. Maybe there's a time pressure or something else. When you're saying those words, when you're being transparent about your emotions and what's happening, then they're learning like, okay, when I I get frustrated, I can just hold up my hand and say, wait a minute, mm-hmm. I need some help or I'm feeling frustrated. And how important is that, you know, in, in work and in life and in relationships? So this idea of, you know, kind of going into yourself and trying to be this perfect mom or even to projecting a perfect mom to them that's not helpful. You know, they need to see human beings. They need to see all of it, you know, all of the beauty that we bring to this life, which is messy sometimes and ugly sometimes. And that's okay because when we're working together and we're communicating, you know, that's the beauty, that's the joy, not this bar of perfection that I don't even, you know, where, know where it comes from. Mm-hmm. But it's those relationships. And that's why we always come back to talk to your kids, take care of those relationships, because when you're in relationship with someone, when you have conflict or challenges or that bad moment, you're still there for each other. And like I said, we've just been through this move. So fresh on the mind, <laughs> but, you know, like everybody that's been involved in this move has seen me probably at my worst, honestly, <laughs> because it's just the stress and the strain and whatever. But, but even in those times, like I'm not a blow up and go crazy kind of person, but I get stressed and do, I, I was able to reach out and connect and just say, this is what I'm needing. I'm feeling so overwhelmed by all of these people trying to move my things when I'm not ready for them to be moved. (laughs) So can we figure out something else? And so those skills of communicating when you have those big emotions, oh my gosh, so critical always. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. So question number three is from Joan in Rhode Island. Love unschooling and wondering. Kids schooled and unschooled learn about race, gender, and class constantly through everyday interactions in the world. To me, this is something that needs to be actively untaught slash retaught because most grown-ups have it all wrong. From my perspective, it is a topic children would like to avoid because they can sense the weight and discomfort of it from grown-ups. I'm wondering how you teach about race, gender, and class in an unschooling format. How can we decolonize our children's understanding of the world and still let them be self-directed. Thank you. Okay, so I think one of the many benefits of unschooling is that we are actually living in the world, you know, not a classroom. And through that living, you know, we meet people from all walks of life. And I think one of the other big benefits that kind of couples with this is that we have time for discussion. So we have time to process things together, things that we see in person, on television, in the news, in our own experiences. We have had in our family many discussions about race, gender, and class over the years. I never set out with an agenda to teach them anything 
but more to be a resource to their own discovery and also to be a sounding board as they processed their own experiences. And I shared my thoughts along the way because that's just who I am. And, you know, just for example, I read a book about school to prison pipeline and I enjoyed talking about that because when I read something, sometimes I want to share, oh my gosh, this was this and this statistic and this was happening. And, you know, they saw me volunteer in prisons and we talked about what that was like and they've seen my work in the community and I've talked about why I felt drawn or compelled to do the things that I have done in our community. And then they would find issues that sparked passions for them. You know, we can't make someone be self-directed or teach that. And we can't have, they're not going to be self-directed in the way that we necessarily want them to be. That would be kind of an oxymoron. (laughs) Um, But we can foster openness and conversations like we've been talking about. We can model critical thinking and questioning, and we can encourage that same critical thinking and questioning, even when it rubs a bit. And I say that because sometimes parents that you know, say that they're wanting this certain thing and I want them to be thinking for themselves and doing this when that gets turned back on them in a way that they're not ready for, then wait a minute. No, you Mm -hmm. can't have that thought. And so, you know, really examine some of that because children have a lot to say about this world and what's going on in it. And it will not always be in agreement with you (laughs) because I mean, I found, and again, I feel pretty strong in my positions and my kids know that, and yet they'll come out with something and I'm like, Hmm, <laughs> Not sure how I feel about that. But I love that because, you know, that's the kind of open discussions we have and we can all have different opinions and we can think about it and look at it different ways. And so that's the beauty of these, you know, self-directed critical thinking youth that are being raised through unschooling. But again, I would, t- I guess, look at some of the language that you have of right and wrong and this way and that way, because that's kind of diametrically opposed to this learning to think for themselves and making their own judgment about the world. Um, I think personally, we can stand to do a lot more listening and facilitating of children and a lot less teaching and imposing. Pam? Oh, I love that. Because that's, (laughs) that nails it right there. Excuse me. I mean, that for us, that has been the huge piece through Mm -hmm. conversations, right? <clears throat> and that, again, you know, back to that adult-child relationship, you know, when you're engaged as human beings in conversation about about everything, all these topics come up. And I think I, the really good point, um, Joan, in the question is that discomfort that adults can feel, right? Mm-hmm. We can, you know, acknowledge that discomfort definitely to ourselves and maybe even out loud if it if it becomes a, an interesting part of the conversation. But the biggest thing we can do is choose to talk about it anyway. Mm-hmm. Right. Over the years, my kids, too, have taken us deep into uncomfortable conversations. But I choose to keep going, not have that scared moment, you know, where, oh, no, that's that's not right. I need to step in. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Whatever the topic, because that's how we learn. I learn things from my kids in these conversations, too. You know, it's not it's not here's this um piece of information or or perspective on things and I need to feed it into my kids. That's the fear piece that that we need to release as we move to self-directed unschooling, etc. That that human beings learn and and when you're facilitating those conversations and as you said that critical thinking that's where they put their picture of the world together. You know, we talk about things we've seen when we're out and about, about comments we've heard people make, things we see in TV show and movies. There is fodder for these conversations everywhere, all the time. And if you feel like your kids are avoiding particular conversations so as not to make you uncomfortable, that's when it's time to just kind of push on your comfort zone a bit and start bringing up the topic yourself. Now, not out of the blue, because that adds more weight to it and more pressure, right? Right. But as we both just said, there's fodder everywhere for these conversations. So just be paying attention and see when you notice something and share an observation, share a thought, you know, Um, just pay extra attention for a while and see where things go. I think you'll be um, amazed and 
and really um, enlightened, for lack of a better <laughs> word. <laughs> Now, also, uh, Erica Davis Petrie shared some great ideas about ways to encourage diversity with applying to race, gender, class, and more in episode 97. And I'll link to that in the show notes. And I just wanted to share the quote of the week that I pulled out from that episode. Mm -hmm. um, Erica said, I really would hope that, especially in the unschooling community, diversity is achieved by moving out of your comfort zone, your area, your neighborhood, and moving into someone else's culture, comfort zone, neighborhood, for all kinds of art classes, library things, swimming things, opportunities for all kinds of cultural and community experiences. And that's just what Anne and I were talking about before. Things come up in life as we're out and about in the world, not stuck in the classroom, having theoretical discussions. We're out and about in the world, engaged with all kinds of people and conversations. And we have that ability. Right, yeah, we have that exactly. ability like Eric is talking about to go to different places because I know in the area where I grew up going to school because I went to school, you know, I was in a classroom with people with basically my same birthday, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from, you know, one of about five neighborhoods right around my neighborhood, you know, and that type of thing. And so we had, I wouldn't even call it diversity, you know, because, and that's what we knew. And so, so I think what I have really seen with unschooling is again, we have friends, all ethnicities from all over the world, all levels of, you know, income and class and all these different pieces. And I just feel like it's, that's, I have found that to be so wonderful and it's given my kids such a different perspective when I hear them having the conversations. I think, you know what? I didn't see these things that they're seeing at this age. I didn't have this understanding of other cultures the way they do because they have friends who are Hindu or friends who are Muslim and friends, you know, that have all these different beliefs. And, and I, gosh, I just love that about unschooling. I know. That's what I'm saying. I feel enlightened having the conversations yes. with them, right? <laughs> All the time. Yeah. All the time. Okay. Next question is from Suparna on Vancouver Island. Hi there. I just found your blog and podcast. Thank you for your clarity, gentleness, and mindfulness. This is exactly the approach to learning I have been searching for, for my now 12-year-old son. Our schooling journey has been rocky and we have finally given it up. We were fooled into thinking that enrolling in a DL school was the same as homeschooling, only just found out we were still in the same bucket, hadn't moved an inch. I think that might be distance learning. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> anyway, long story short, that's not me, that's her. Here I am <laughs> devouring your webpage and podcasts. I love the love what they are doing approach, but my question is what to do if their interests slash passions bore you to tears. <laughs> My son is mechanically inclined. He is super passionate about remote control cars, vehicles, and will sit at the computer surfing for hours, pondering and poring over makes, models, whatchamacallits, and who's it's and doodads. <laughs> I have tried really hard to be interested, but it's all mind numbing to me. I am happy to encourage and provide him with whatever he needs to fulfill his passions, but there is a limit to how far I can go with his interests. I am a more artistic, fluid, organic person. So how do you fully help your child develop his interests if you can just barely understand what he is doing? Thank you for reading. Hi, Saparna. Yay, I loved your question. <laughs> <laughs> now, basically, you help him develop his interests by fully supporting him as he explores. And you mentioned that you're happy to encourage him and to provide him with whatever he needs. And that sounds great. So really, the question of whether that's enough is best directed to him. Oh, here we're back at those conversations, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How involved does he want you to be? Is he asking for more engagement from you? And if he is, even that doesn't necessarily mean you need to understand the topic in depth yourself. Instead, maybe you can take a few key phrases and ideas that I'm sure you've heard him share and use those to do a bit of research. So maybe finding a local RC vehicle group you could point him to. Or a related magazine you could subscribe him to as a surprise. You know, you don't need to understand it all mechanically to bring your artistic flair to his exploration, right? You can, like, be a connector um, between him and other things without understanding. So maybe he goes, maybe you find a group, maybe it's a rocket group. 
Um, maybe it's specifically RC vehicles. You know, you, you take him and, and you guys check it out and, and maybe he connects with people and tries it and, and stays. Maybe he doesn't. But it's it's you expressing an interest and supporting his interest and helping him um, with his exploration and using your kind of artistic out of the box thinking to come up with interesting ways to connect if that's if that's something he's looking for you know if he is happy with all the encouragement and support you're providing with him now that's great again it's back to conversations with our kids so we know um, what what their needs are and what their wishes are and if those are the things being met what do you think Anna yeah, I mean, I definitely found that I didn't have to share the passion to support yeah. it um, and really didn't even need to understand it. You know, I will say there is definitely lots of listening <laughs> um, yeah. and, you know, taking in information of things that I didn't necessarily understand or sometimes weren't interested in. But instead of focusing on maybe my lack of enjoyment of a particular subject matter, I would just connect with the joy of their telling because, you know, that was so easy for me to enjoy. You know, I, and honestly, I, I, I'm kind of like this with anyone. If somebody is passionately telling me about something they love, like I just get excited about that. No, me too. <laughs> I just think, oh my gosh, they love this and look at how cool it is. And I know that I do it too. So people are, you know, we're going to hear about cows or farming or whatever I'm interested in at the moment. So, um, you know, so I, I, I love that energy of someone enjoying something. I don't have to, you know, necessarily take it on. And again, I think it's just like, like Pam talked about and really even what you're already doing, it's finding resources and mentors that understood the passion, because I do think connecting them to people who speak the language related to their passion is, is really important because it's fun to then find that person that can add on to what you're saying and that can take you maybe to a next level of something you haven't thought about. So it's fun to share with anyone, but then it's really nice to have that person that speaks that same language. So that's really Really what I would look for, you know, like Pam said, the RC club or the whatever, where people can speak that language and kind of take it to the next step. And, you know, there's and finding other resources. That's really what I saw a big piece of my work when my kids were younger was finding resources. And that was interesting to me. So while maybe the specific topic wasn't interesting to me, figuring out which resources best supported the passion was a puzzle that I found interesting. So it could be books or it could be a better computer, or it could be different software, it could be a local group or a mentor or whatever. And so that was a puzzle piece that I found interesting. So find that way to, you know, make it something like she was saying, connecting this bridge between the art and the things that you love with this passion that he loves and supporting him in a way that, you know, can kind of help him go to that next level. So I, I really, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. You know, you have to love what they're doing or not. So anyway, I love that point because that's that's what I love too the the research piece um, yes. because it was their excitement and you wanted to yes. um, to reengage that excitement because that was always fun. But you're right. You, it didn't have to be through um, detailed knowledge about the topic itself. It could right. be through researching anything in particular. You know, it could be uh, research, you know, even if it's uh, video games and, and you come across, uh, you know, an orchestral concert playing yes. video game music. I remember, you know, that. And you say, like, hey, you know what? This is going on. There, You know, things that is that it isn't on their radar, things that they mm -hmm. don't kind of know kind of exist. You know, maybe they don't know about paper magazines. Maybe there's a paper magazine. It'd be fun to get some mail. You know, we used to get Nintendo Power way back mm -hmm. when, right? <laughs> you know, there's just so many ways that you can connect um, with them through the interest and being able to, you know, connect them with new things in the world. Anyway, I thought I thought that was a great point to separate the the understanding of the topic with with the research because the research was something that I loved too. Right, and you can kind of yeah. tweak that to be a way that works for you. You know, you and I yeah, like research yeah. in the same way, but even if you don't, you know, my friend Find Pat's something a different else. type of personality, more right brain, but she loves research in the same way too. You know, so I mean, in, in a different way too. So that I think it, you can find a way for that to work. Yeah. Okay, so I am going to go on to question five from Candace in Pennsylvania. 
Hi. First, I need to say how grateful I am for your podcast, especially the Q&A episodes. The discussions feed my soul and ground me. On to my question. I'm very empathetic. I have been told more than once that I'm an empath. I'm not sure if I'm totally comfortable with that label, but I do know that I notice, feel, and experience other people's emotions without them actually telling me how they feel. For example, I teach yoga and often people come to class to release their own emotional weight. I have left from teaching feeling very sad only to find out that one of my students' dog died the day before. My five-year-old son has anxiety issues and is not comfortable in crowds. I believe that my six, almost seven-year-old daughter is very much like me. She loves being around other people and kids, but it also exhausts her emotionally. She will also go through days of feeling sad and not knowing why or being angry at the world or her family and life. I was very much like that as a child, and my parents tried hard to shame it out of me, telling me that my emotions were hurting other people or ruining our family time. It took me most of my adult life to make peace with the sadness within myself, and I wish to impart this peace onto my children. Their unique way of experiencing the world leads us, led us out of public schools to homeschooling, ultimately to unschooling. I am so very sure that unschooling is the right choice for our family. My son is relaxing to himself and actually finding the words to let other people know when he needs a break, and my daughter is learning so much in ways that I never could have imagined. However, since moving away from the conventional parenting style, such as seeing my kids' negative emotions as something to fix, towards a deeper, more honest, and level connection with my kids, seeing my kids as they are without needing to be fixed, I have begun to take on their emotions. When I was less connected with them and they were sad, I could separate myself from their emotions. Now I get stuck in their headspace. How can I continue to connect with them without carrying that weight with me? Right now, they're going through this amazing emotional journey, finding language for feelings and coping skills and ways to find comfort when that is needed. But all of this emotional openness has left me feeling raw, weepy, and exhausted. It is, is this the way it has to be because of my empathetic side, or is there a better way for me to connect without falling into their struggles? Any insight is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Candace, thank you for that question. Um, I definitely understand taking on others' emotions, and I also didn't really understand it when I was younger and have worked throughout my life to be aware of where my feelings were coming from and kind of where my feelings ended and where I was taking on uh, someone else's feelings. And for me, you know, I think finding a mantra or imagery can be really helpful. And the imagery that has helped me is to imagine that I'm the rock in the river and that the emotions are the water easily flowing over me. So I'm there and I'm connected and I'm grounded, but the emotions don't knock me over. Um, grounding myself in general is also has been a really helpful tool. If I'm part of a particularly emotionally charged discussion, I will go outside and put my feet on the earth. You know, just being outside helps me. But if I'm really feeling a lot of emotion and kind of bombardment, I will actually lay on the earth. And it is the most amazing feeling to just let go of all of that into the earth. You can just honestly try it if you haven't. Like you just really feel that shift. And I know that I don't need to carry it. And so for me, it's really all been about awareness. When I can separate my emotions from those around me, I need to be fully present for them. Taking on their anger or upset doesn't serve either one of us. Um, and I would say it was much more like that when I was younger. You know, I would get upset when someone was upset because I could just feel it. And I would just let their, you know, upset and anger kind of take me to that place. And now people that know me and only know me as older just find me to be really calm and level-headed and whatever. And it's not that I don't feel that still. It's just that I'm able to separate it from my own emotions. And, and because I like to be there for people, I really prefer staying in this place of being grounded in just my own emotions because then I'm able to offer the support. So my joining in their emotions really isn't supporting them as much as me staying grounded and being there for them to have that expression as their own because it's their own. And, you know, that it's also something that, again, I think talk to your kids about it. And, you know, so they're going to be developing their own tools. And I think the practice will just serve you in other areas of your life. You know, it's well worth any work in this area to be beautifully connected to your children. 
So I think, again, this is that piece of that um, transparency where we can talk to our kids like, wow, I'm, I'm feeling you know, all of this emotion from this discussion and I'm really taking this on and I need just a minute to kind of regroup or think so then they're going, oh, okay, she's hearing me, but she's needing a minute. Sometimes I feel like that too. And so, again, I think this transparency and having conversations with our kids as we're working through our emotions and upsets, it's just, it's such, it's such a great gift because it, it helps them see real life, you know, that we're all human and we all have all these things going on. So we don't pretend to be something that we're not. You're an emotional being and that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So anyway, Pam, what about you? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, what, what worked for me or what works for me mostly (laughs) is, is to, um, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a, more of a an analytical side, so I realize that that mm-hmm. I'm not helping really anyone when I take that on, because when I I noticed you know through experience when I took on their struggles and their sadness as my own weight, we kind of um, just kept spiraling each other down even more, and we really got stuck. And I realized when I didn't take right. on their weight. I I was just just by being there, my presence um, being lighter and not um, heavy. I mean, you can just see it. You can feel it in the person, right? As she was saying, you know, even without the conversation, it it comes. The energy comes across. But without when we don't take on their weight, we show them that this is not the end of the world. You know, we can right, represent right. the light at the end of the tunnel. And and it's not that we're dragging them there on their on our timetable, right? That oh, you need to stop being sad. Yeah. Um, it's not not that they need to be happy or anything like that, but that it's there when they're ready. It's like like you know you being the rock. It's the same kind of metaphor, right? Mm-hmm. Being the rock and letting it wash through that you're solid and that you're there. And through experience, I also learned that I am more able to have conversations with them, to process what they're sharing, process it back with them, brainstorm ideas with them, validate their perspective and their feelings when I'm not mired in the struggle myself. So eventually I realized that was my work to do when these things were happening, to validate them and to release any weight that they may be handing me, maybe needing to hand me, recognizing that it's not my own and that I truly am of more value to them without it. Now, Anne has a great article about validating on her website, and I'll link to that in the show notes. And you can hear her talk more about it specifically in Q&A episode 112 in answer to the first question. But I thought I would just share a quick quote um, from her article. While I can see my child's world from his perspective and deeply validate from that place, I also need to be in this place of trusting that all is well, both for him and for myself. My child needs this for me, especially when he's feeling sad or otherwise challenged and is not able to connect to any light in his life, not able to reach for a better feeling place at all. He can feel that I am not pitying him. He can feel that I'm not feeling sorry for him. He can feel that I understand him, that I see him, that I hear him, that I know that this is hard. And yet he knows that I do trust in him and his path no matter what. He can feel that I am ready to help him in any way I can, any way that he needs me to. He can count on me to throw him a lifeline when he needs it because I have stayed in the perfect position to be of value to him by not disappearing into his emotions and doubling the weight and the darkness that he is already carrying. And I mean, in my experience over and over, when I am able to hold that space, be that rock, be that light, you know, choosing, choosing whatever metaphor works for you that you can connect to in that moment, right? That you can en- envision in that moment and that can keep you grounded, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
or literally B. I'm going to try that next time. Yeah, try it. I'm <laughs> what, telling once, you, once winter goes. <laughs> so, I, I mean, middle... any time I get somebody to do it to lay down, they're like, whoa. I mean, you just, there's just an energetic feel to the earth. So it's really cool <laughs> to feel that, just letting all of that go. And something I wanted to say, too, that brought up from what you said and some of the pieces from Anne, I, I think it's really important for, um, I think it can be hard for kids if they, believe they're responsible for our emotions. So I'm trying to think how to word this, but I think, so if they're coming at us with something big, big emotion, big anger, big whatever, and we do take that on and it somehow changes us, I think that makes that emotion even scarier for them because it's like, whoa, this is, this is changing mom. This is changing dad. Like everybody, this is, this is big. This is big as the world. It's you know, this terrible, terrible thing. But I think when they can see that calmness, but yet attentiveness, like Anne saying, I mean, really, they are truly validating that they can be um, like rest assured, you know, and that doesn't mean they're going to instantly yeah. snap out of it. But it, it's I think it's very scary for us to think that we are changing someone else's emotion. <laughs> and so there's something we've talked about over the years is that we are each responsible for our own emotions. Nobody makes me feel any particular way. That is a choice that I make. And that is my job as someone who does feel things pretty deeply to to figure that out, you know, and to not, and to not let someone else feel like they're responsible for that. So I don't know. I think there's a little bit more there you may want to think about and, and read the stuff from Anne and maybe there's some things that will, you know, land for you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, in the, in that moment when they're coming to you with this upset, with this struggle, with whatever it is, it is, you know, it's their world. It's overwhelming them in their world. Right. And if you get overwhelmed too, it's like, Oh my goodness, you know, it yeah. just got bigger. Yeah. Right? But if they can see that you can totally take it all in mm-hmm. and keep your calm for them, then then it helps it helps right away just to put it in perspective and to realize that oh my gosh, you know, the world isn't ending. Right. We can, you know, continue to talk through this. We can we can figure it out. Yes. However long it takes, right? Right? Through that validation. Anyway, yes, I love that. It's such a great point. And conversations with your kids. <laughs> I think we found a theme. It's a beautiful theme, everyone. I mean, you will be just just amazed, amazed yeah. and enthra- enthralled with with your with your kids and your conversations. They they do. It's no longer eventually adult kids. It's human beings talking and sharing and yeah. connecting and arguing and you know all yes. the things. It, it's life. It's life together. I love it. Okay. <laughs> I know I have goosebumps now. <laughs> anyway, that is the last question for this month. Thank you so much, Anna, for answering oh, questions with me. It's always me. fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> and just a reminder, there are links in the show notes for the things that we mentioned in the episode. And as always, if you'd like to submit a question for the Q&A show, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the first book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Free to Learn, Five Ideas for a Joyful Unschooling Life. In it, I share the five paradigm-changing ideas that most help me better understand unschooling. Reviewers have said, A quick read, but packed with ideas that challenge the dominant paradigm of our failing approach to learning, this little gem makes an excellent argument for unschooling. And, I was rather doubtful about this book, as I had never heard of the author, but after reading it, I wish that I had read it years ago. I hope you find it helpful too. Free to Learn has also been translated into French and Spanish. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.